Okay, uh, this is uh, week four, uh, chapter four, cultural psychology. We're going to be talking about methods for studying culture and psychology. I have to warn you, there's a little bit of nudity in today's lecture, but there's a reason for it, and I hope it makes sense to you when you see it. Uh, what should uh, always be the initial step in studying people from other cultures uh, is to learn something about the culture under study. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way in avoiding costly and embarrassing mistakes. Schwader, Schwader and his colleagues in 1997 were researching family meals. They sought information from rural India and called ahead to optimize their time there. Though people in this area of rural India did not participate in family meals, an obliging local psychologist convinced a family to sit down at a table to simulate what the researchers were looking for. The researchers happily recorded their discovery and mistakenly included it in their research. This is what they showed. Of course, Indians don't do this. Not in that part of, of India anyway. When they eat a meal, they do it like that. There you go. The men eat eat by themselves. The children eat with the mothers. Uh, that's the way they eat. But unfortunately, of course, they showed a family meal. Uh, and they, in, they included it in their research, and their research was tainted because of that. One can learn about another culture in a variety of ways. The simplest way is to read existing texts and ethnographies about the culture. However, learning about a culture through books and ethnographies limits you to learning about the ideas the author thought were relevant. I know, I know a lot of people who write books are very, very intelligent, but a lot of times they have their own agenda. Sometimes they have their own uh, prejudices, and those prejudices can come out in their writing. Another approach is to find a collaborator who is from the culture that you are studying and who is interested in pursuing the same research with you. The more involved your collaborator is in the project, the more likely you will get accurate information. The International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology is an organization of researchers studying culture and psychology from all around the world, and its members routinely find members from other countries to collaborate with on cross-cultural projects. Another effect, this is a, there's nudity in the next picture, but there's a reason for it. Another effective strategy is to immerse oneself in another culture to learn it firsthand. This is an excellent way to gain a rich understanding of another culture, but it can be time-consuming and cost costly. There is no substitute for first-hand experience. That's not a pun. The idea is here, these women don't wear shirts ever. This woman never goes out without, her sh without a shirt and her brassiere on. And here the, the women are trying to figure out what in the world uh, is going on with her breasts. Uh, because she's, of course, white uh, and she's not African. And these individuals are African and they're trying to figure out what's going on. I thought that was a very um, apropos uh, picture when we're talking about what we're talking about, uh, being immersing yourself in one's culture, uh, in, the, uh, in another culture. Now, the reality is I don't know how these people would feel if she ran around like they did, like, the, like they are, because they see her as different anyway. So that's uh, really a question that you have to ask yourself. Uh, if you go to Africa and, and nobody's wearing clothes, or you go to, down to the Amazon uh, River uh, and uh, immerse yourself in one of those tribes, they don't wear any clothes at all. So you can imagine them looking at you and seeing you as, as, as alien to them, uh, and if, if, especially if you tried to act like them or tried to wear no clothes like they did. They might see you as... Uh, I don't know. They might see it as, as more negative uh, than if you're just want, wandering around trying to figure out who they are. In 1997, Patricia Greenfield was doing field research about the making of textiles in Mexico. She gave the Zinacontecos uh, women the same survey about their textile making that she had used all over the world. The women became angry. 
uh, Zin, Zin, the Zinakatekos women approached the survey as they would a conversation. When Greenfield asked similar questions, a methodological sound interview technique, they thought that she was stupid or making fun of them, and it made them angry, and that is what was going on. These are actually pictures of Zinnik and Tekos, uh, the uh, women. Uh, I found a picture, and that is that exciting. Having your methods perceived in identical ways across different cultures is termed methodological equivalence. Sometimes researchers have to adapt their procedures so that it is understandable in each culture equally. The vast majority of cross-cultural research has been conducted between industrialized societies. The most common comparisons are between North Americans and East Asians. Studying college students from different cultures also lends itself to making meaningful comparisons, as students the world over tend to be familiar with many of the kinds of procedures used in psychological studies, and college students tend to be an accessible sample for most uh, university researchers. When researchers overemphasize college students, there tends to be a significant problem with generalizability. The research can't be generalized with any populations but other college students. Overusing students affects power. Uh, power reflects the quality of the design of the study and determines if their design is sensitive enough to identify the anticipated effects. Sometimes the hypothesis is correct, but the design doesn't have the power to be able to provide support for it. In cross-cultural studies, culture should always be an independent variable. If researchers contrast two similar cultures, they would not have as much variance in their independent variable as if they had compared two or more two very dissimilar cultures. Psychological concepts do not always translate from one culture to, to the next. Japanese ame has no equivalent in English. Uh, it is the inappropriate behavior that shows dependence on someone else. It's all uh, kind of like codependency, but one person is kind of grouchy about it, and the other, other person is very, is very subservient. Um, if, if I saw somebody uh, acting like this, I would probably diagnose it as codependence. But in Japan, it's very, very common. In G German, schadenfreude uh, has no equivalent in English. Uh, it is the pleasant feeling from seeing someone else's pain, uh, someone else suffering. As weird as that sounds, only the, well, okay. Uh, Ephalok uh, Fago has no equivalent in English. Fago is a mark of maturity that shows compassion for the weak and, the, and love and sadness for them. The Chinese have no translation of the word self-esteem. It doesn't have, it isn't a word that the Chinese use. It's not a concept that the Chinese have, this concept of self-esteem. Uh, poor translation, sign seen in a Chinese hotel. Please don't accept strangler's in invitation so as not to be cheated. Strangler, not stranger, but strangler. <laughs> Uh, sign in a Chinese store, please don't touch yourself, let us help try you out. Which sounds kind of risque, but of course they didn't mean what it actually says. Sign in a Cambodian hotel, wishing you a bon voyage. It should be bon voyage, which is French for good voyage. Bon, bon, okay. Sign in a Hong Kong bathroom for keeping toilet clean and tidy. Please dump it the, the dustbin. They're not talking about having a bowel movement into the into the trash can. They're talking about putting your trash in the trash can. <laughs> Sign on Japanese street when carrying a parasol. Please be careful to get in the way of other people around you. Whoops, they left out not, didn't they? Sign at the Japanese drugstore. We make up prescriptions. Okay. Signed in Bucharest Hotel Lobby. Uh, the lift is being fixed for the next day. Uh, during the time, we regret that you will be unbearable. <laughs> Signed in a Paris hotel. Please leave your values at the front front desk. They mean meant to say valuables, but they said values. 
Sign in at Athens Hotel. Visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of 9 and 11 daily. Uh, sign in at a Japanese hotel. You were invited to take advantage of the chambermaid, which has two different meanings. <laughs> sign in a Paris dress shop dresses for street walking. Street walking is prostitution. <laughs> is prostitution. Now this is kind of an interesting picture because this lady really is a street walker. How do I know that? Because this is in a Europe. Uh, in a Europe, when you cross your ankles like that, it means that you are uh, ready, you're open for business, even though you're. I don't know. Anyway, that's when I was in Germany back in the in the eighties. Uh, uh, we were told to be very, very careful. Uh, the ladies standing, or the ladies uh, on the side of the road, aren't looking for. Uh, they're not hitchhiking. They're uh, they're looking for business. Uh, anyway, that's how they tell is by crossing their ankles. And if you've ever tried to stand like that, it's not the easiest thing in the world. You feel like you're about to fall over. Sign in German campground. It is strictly forbidden on our Black Forest camping site that people of different sex, for instance, men and women, live together in one tent unless they are married with each other for that purpose. As weird as that sounds. Soviet Weekly Newspaper. There will be a Moscow uh, exhibit of arts. I'm sorry, Moscow exhibit of arts by 15,000 Soviet Republic painters and sculptors. These were executed over the past two years. <laughs> uh, okay. Sign in a Mallorcan uh, shop. Here, speaking American. They speak America there. So there you go. Uh, Mallorca is a uh, belongs. I think it's it's an island in the in the Mediterranean Sea that belongs to Spain, I think. I think it belongs to Spain. Even for relatively fluent speakers, word choice can be a problem. The most commonly used method of ensuring that a translation is accurate is to have someone translate the translation back into English. This technique is known as the back translation method, which is probably a good way of doing things. Response biases are, are factors that distort the accuracy of, person, of a person's response to surveys, and they become especially problematic when we compare groups that differ in their response biases. Some people will try to seem more socially desirable in their answers and disguise their true feelings to appear more socially desirable. There's a tendency for people from different cultures to vary in terms of how likely they are to express their agreement in a moderate fashion. Choosing an item close to the end of the scale, this is known as extremity bias. Choosing an item in the middle of the scale is known as moderacy bias. African Americans and Hispanic Americans tend to give more extreme responses than Americans of European descent. East Asians tend to be more moderate in their responses than European Americans. East Asians show a greater moderacy bias when they complete the materials in their native language than when they complete them in English. One way to fix moderacy and extremity biases is by having the respondent answer yes or no rather than using a Likert-like scale. Though it is hard to quantify, yes, no answers, uh, yes, no answers, of course, and this is a sad situation for statisticians since it's either a zero or a one. A tendency, a tendency to agree with most statements is known as acquiescence bias and is, is an issue for cross-cultural comparisons. The acquiescence bias is a problem for cross-cultural research because cultures differ in their tendencies to agree with items. East Asians tend to have a relatively holistic way of looking at the world, and one consequence is that there are more possible truths in a holistic world. This tends to make them see truth in most statements. Now, if you see truth in most statements, that means you very rarely see anything that's not true. So East Asians tend to accept everything that is said. Or written.
Sorry, I needed a drink. <clears throat> People tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves with others. This is uh, similar others. Usually we're looking for somebody that's very similar to us. So I did my grandson this weekend. He compares himself to uh, kids who play football and kids who play soccer. Uh, those are the, those are his uh, the people that he compares himself with, because he plays football. He also plays soccer. When we are assessing ourselves in terms of how tall, intelligent, or punctual we are, what matters is how tall, intelligent, or punctual we, we view ourselves compared to most other people around us. So if we're if we live in a family where nobody is ever punctual, uh, then probably punctuality is not important to us. Or it has a different meaning for us than it does to everybody else. Reference group effect is critical for cross-cultural research because people from different cultures tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves to different reference groups and thus to different standards. Understanding the reference group conundrum, the researchers should always be aware of the reference group effect. One classic example of reference group effect was a study done looking at African-American soldiers in 1949 while the South was still suffering through Jim Crow. The soldiers were less satisfied about living in the North than living in the, the repressive South. Could it be that they didn't like the better treatment and the obvious freedoms that they found in the North? With analysis, they found that the soldiers gave their answers because they were using local African-Americans as their reference group. Because African Americans were better off in the North than the South, the soldier's life was more satisfying in the South by comparison. When asked how much people valued enjoying life and pleasure, the results showed that the dour uh, East Germans who couldn't get, uh, you couldn't get them to laugh uh, or smile unless somebody's bleeding, scored the third highest on the survey. East Germans, despite the fact that if you've ever been around, of course, East Germany doesn't exist anymore, uh, but I was over in Germany when there was an East Germany and there was a West Germany, and I'll tell you, these are about the grouchiest people you've ever been around. They never smiled. Italians who maintain a lifestyle emphasizing good food, leisurely breaks in, in cafes, opera, art, and long summer vacations uh, came in next to last on the enjoying life and pleasure scale whereas the East Germans came in third. <laughs> on the humility scale, the arrogant Americans scored higher on the scale than the humble Chinese. The collectivist Chinese scored higher on the choosing one's own goals scale than the ind individualistic Americans. The deprivation effect involves people valuing things that they have little of, uh, little of rather than, than what they have in abundance. Thus, uh, since there is a dearth of humbleness among Americans, they value humility more than the Chinese who are taught humility from birth. Subjective self-report measures work fine within cultures because cultural members tend to share the same response biases and reference groups. But subjective self-report measures do not work well between cultures because the members have different res response styles and reference groups. Cross-cultural studies are possible, but one variable that can not be manipulated is cultural background. The comparisons of culture are not true experiments, but quasi-experiments. Culture cannot be controlled, but other independent variables can. After randomly assigning subjects to groups, a researcher can administer different levels of the independent variable to each group. Any differences in their responses or behaviors that are observed must be due to the independent variable, as this is the only thing that differs systematically between the experimental conditions. A second method of doing cross-cultural research is within group manipulation. Each participant receives more than one level of the independent variable. Within group manipulation does not require random assignment because each participant receives each level of the, of the independent variable. Each participant also acts as their own control. Oh, there's more nudity. I, I, th this next picture is a picture of a, an advertisement 
uh, from Korea. It's an Oreo cookie advertisement. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as magazine advertisement. And this, of course, is a magazine advertisement. The baby is drinking his mother's milk, and he's going to have an Oreo cookie with his milk. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as laws. China passed a law in 2013 that adult children must visit their parents often. Now, how do you define the word often, I guess, is the question. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as newspaper articles. Uh, most headlines around the world were about President Trump's inauguration, but from the country, that country's point of view, uh, Trump, uh, this is a, uh, this is a magazine from Montreal. Oh my God. Le Journal of Montreal. Trump à la maison blanc, which means the uh, Trump is in the, is in the White House. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as fairy tales. The oldest written fairy tale is Abdullah the Fisherman and Abdullah the Merman, written in 850 AD in Persia. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as children's stories, uh, around, stories from around the world. There we go. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as sports coverage around the world. Uh, in the United States, we like to see a lot of pictures. Um, in other places, they don't have pictures. They want commentary. Uh, past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as personal ads. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as web pages. A key point to realize about research is that no single study is perfect. Every study has potential methodological shortcomings or alternative theoretical explanations. One important skill that's, that students learn in graduate school in psychology is precisely how to come up with alternative explanations for virtually any study that, in, that they encounter. In science, researchers and readers of research use the principle of Occam's razor to help with determining the quality of research. Occam's razor states that any theory should make as few assumptions as possible, shaving off any extraneous assumptions. All else held equal, Occam's razor maintains that the simpler theory is more correct. Following Occam's razor, a single explanation is more parsimonious and more likely to be correct than four separate explanations. Research has always shown that the South is the most violent region in the United States and that this has been true since the very founding of the nation. And this, uh, of course, this is what de Tocqueville said in 1835. While violence exists in other regions of the country, the Old West, uh, for example, the South has uh, led the nation in lynchings, sniper attacks, feuds, homicides, and duels. Andrew Jackson, the individual that you see on your $20 bill, once killed a man in a duel over the honor of his wife, who at the time was married to both Jackson and her first husband while she waited for her divorce to be finalized. He killed him anyway, even though the guy uh, said that uh, his wife was a bigamist. And it so incensed him that he killed the man. Fisher in, 19, in 1989 speculates that the South has always been more uh, tolerant, has had more tolerance for aggressive pursuits. Uh, reports from the colonial days chronicle uh, no holds barred fights where eyes were gouged and noses and ears were bitten off. Or, or purring where uh, two men held each other's shoulders and kicked each other in the shins until until one let go. This is what purring looks like. This is how stupid this is. You just kick each other in the in the shins until somebody lets go. The South South has always been more tolerant than the North concerning corporal punishment of children, capital punishment of criminals, gun ownership, 
going to war whenever the gauntlet is mentioned. Southern high school students are more likely to bring a weapon to school. The South has more school shootings. There have been uh, several theories as to why the South has involved one, uh, evolved one way and the rest of the country has evolved another. Uh, it's, hot, uh, has, it's hot with uncomfortable temperatures. Uh, that's by Anderson, 1989. Uh, it has greater poverty. This is what de Tocqueville said in 1835. It has a long history of slavery where there is a tolerance for inhumane treatment. And that's what Tocqueville, de Tocqueville said in 1835. Now you wonder why de Tocqueville is talking about uh, the United States and slavery. De Tocqueville was from France. And uh, he came to the United States in 1835, and he wrote this long treatise about what was going on in, in, uh, the, in, in uh, the United States, in America. Uh, and the reason he did this was because uh, only, it had only been about 40 years that the United States had been a free country. And one of the things that he wanted to note was, uh, how were things going in, in the United States? And that's uh, the reason he came over here. And, of course, by this time, by 1835, not only had France given up uh, slavery, but so had England. So, most, for, so Europe was slave-free. Uh, and here we are in the United States. We were one of the only uh, uh, places on earth where slavery was still tolerated. Nisbet and Cohen in 1996 posit that one factor that has led to more violence in the South is that the South was settled by herders, which has given rise to a culture of honor. A culture of honor is one where men strive to protect their reputation through aggression. Herders are more susceptible to violence because their wealth is more portable where the land is more marginal. Thus, it is important for herders to develop a reputation of violent retaliation to keep thieves away from their wealth a culture of honor. The sense of honor has to be established before their wealth is affected, thus you need to be violent before anyone tries to steal your livestock. And of course, I guess American Indians, I guess the Navajo at least, uh, could uh, be similar to the uh, Southerners. The herder culture of honor is not limited to the United States, but uh, may have been brought here by the Scots-Irish, who, who made up the lion's share of people settling in the South. They were herders in the old country. Herders around the world maintain this bloviated code. Looking at our archival data, Nisbet and Cohen in 1997 found that when you compared records of rural North with rural South, they found that not only was the homicide rate higher, but when they compared herding regions of the South with farming regions of the South, the homicide rate was twice that in the herding region than it was in the farming region. Cohen and Nesman in 1994 next conducted telephone interviews of Northerners and Southerners and discovered that while they had similar negative feelings about violence, Southerners were more likely to have positive attitudes toward defending their families or their honor. Noting that testosterone rises when men are ready to, to aggress, Nisbet and Cohen et al. in 1996 arranged for, for Northern and Southern students to be put on a vaguely insulting situation. Uh, he then measured the testosterone of each participant. Measuring testosterone for, from saliva samples, the researchers discovered that while the northern students reacted minimally to the insult from 4 to 5 milligrams of testosterone, the southern students were ready to aggress after the insult to a testosterone level of 12.5 milligrams from a level of 4 milligrams. So the southerner uh, the Southerners uh, actually, um, when they were insulted, uh, they produced more testosterone, giving them, making them more aggressive. Cohen and his colleagues in 1996 conducted a similar study where they forced the participants into a narrow hallway with a much larger person. What they were measuring was how long it took the participants to step out of the man mountain's way, a game of human chicken. The situation was set up by either insulting the participant before they played hallway chicken or not. 
Northerners reacted in a similar manner, whether they were insulted or not. Uh, they turned at 60 inches, or and they turned at 75 inches, respectively. Southerners, on the other hand, stepped out of the way earlier when not in insulted at 110 inches. That's known as Southern hospitality. But after an insult, they, they, they approached the Man Mountain on average of 35 inches before veering off. Culture of honor in play. And that is the end of the lecture. So there you go. Uh, stay safe. I'll see you guys next week. Uh, stay safe.